Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, welcome to, uh, to our Green and Confined series today. Uh, let me uh, double check because I think uh, we see uh, Diego Cancel on the, on the screen. Um, let me see if uh, you guys can see me. But um, this is uh, Teddy. Teddy Lutelier from the University of Miami. I'm the sustainability manager uh, for the university. This Green and Confined series uh, is going to be dedicated today to uh, something that I've been wanting to do for a long time to get uh, this great organization uh, with us to teach us a little bit more about the connection between water and, uh, and energy and how to be more sustainable uh, in your home. Uh, I'm talking about Dreaming Green. You've seen them everywhere in Miami. Uh, been here for a long time. And um, so before I introduce our main uh, panelists and, um, and, and, uh, and the association, the nonprofit uh, Dreaming Green, I'd like to uh, just give you some housekeeping rules. Um, we'll uh, record this, uh, this webinar so you'll have a chance to actually uh, uh, you know, share it if you want uh, later on. Uh, you'll have a follow up. They will send you an email about everything that you can do after this webinar. Uh, if you have questions, we'll have a few minutes at the end to answer some questions. Use the Q and A. Uh, the chat is not open, but the Q and A is. So anytime during the the um, uh, the webinar, you can ask questions. All right. So that's um, that's it for the housekeeping rules. The the, I'm, I'm going to introduce uh, Diego mostly, um, but we'll have other uh, uh, panelists also with him. Um, so Diego is uh, Diego Cancel is uh, originally from uh, Bayamon, Puerto Rico, and graduated from North Carolina State University with a degree in uh, environmental technology and management. Is uh, currently the program coordinator for Dreaming Green. So Dreaming Green is a nonprofit that has been working in South Florida for 14 years, with a mission to empower individuals to lead in the response to climate change and other environmental issues. And uh, Diego is gonna tell you everything about this great organization. The other two panelists uh, that will join us, um, maybe one of them won't be able to join, we'll see. Uh, but one of them is here, it's Patrick Martin, working for the Miami-Dade County Water and Sewer Management, um, Water and Sewer Department and we'll talk to you about the water conservation. The other person that may join us is Jan Marie Massam from uh, Miami-Dade uh, Solid Waste Department. And uh, with that, Diego. Got it. Forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> um, so I hope you guys can see the presentation, right? Awesome. So yeah, my name is Diego Cancel. Thank you for the intro. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm the program coordinator for Dream and Green. You guys are here today for the water and energy learning and behavior um, workshop. Basically, we're going to be talking about um, water and energy, how they're inherently connected, and then what you as an individual can do to reduce your usage, which also connects to global climate change in the environment and our carbon footprint. So I always like to show this, just thank you to Miami-Dade and um, the Miami Foundation. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do these workshops for free. 
um, which also you guys will be eligible to get a free toolkit. And I'll talk about the toolkit a little bit later, or uh, me and Patrick can talk about it a little bit later. Um, basically, Dream and Green, we already got a good intro, but we empower people to not just do the three easy R's, which is reduce, reuse, recycle, right? You hear that every day or every other day. But yeah, we, we empower individuals just to reject, repair, react, and actually get involved, not just um, do the three R's. So like I said, you guys are here to learn about the We Lab today. Um, and we have we continuously update this just to show people that we've been doing these for a long time. We do it all over Miami-Dade County and sometimes in other places throughout South, South Florida to bring this education. Um, this is our website really quick, just so you guys can see. We have resources there if you guys are interested in learning more after the workshop about water and energy and recycling and how to reduce them. And we also have added now some resources for uh, during COVID and everything. So this is just a quick um, agenda just to show you guys. We're going to be talking about the water energy nexus. Then Patrick is going to come in and talk about Miami-Dade County water and sewer, where our water comes from, our water resources as a whole. Um, our third presenter might not be able to join, but hopefully she can. Jean Marie, she talks about recycling, and if not, I'll do that. And then problems and ways to help. Basically, we'll talk about global climate change and how all of this connects. And then we'll talk about some tools and resources for you guys to take. So before we get started, we will actually have um, three different polls throughout the uh, workshop. So hopefully you guys can be you know, um, give us some answers and that way um, just to, to gauge where you guys are at as we're going. So the water energy <clears throat> nexus, what I've said already, water and energy are inherently connected. You need water to create energy, right? And you need energy to create clean water that we use every day in our households. So some examples, how do we use water for energy? So creating electricity actually is a very um, hot process. So we got to keep our power plants cool and we use a lot, a lot, a lot of water um, to be able to keep them running. And then for oil and gas, when we're getting oil and gas out of our planet also requires water and even renewable energies often use a lot of water in the creation of them, but also like hydropower and things like that. So how do we use energy for water? So if you think about pumping, like even the physical um, aspect of pumping you yourself, if you were doing it right, that requires your own energy to get water out of um, the planet. So can you imagine how much energy it takes for Miami-Dade County to provide water to everybody in Miami-Dade County? Um, it's a lot of energy. So water treatment plants, again, yeah, it, that requires a lot of water for us to be able to have water at home to shower and cook and drink. Uh, heating and cooling systems, again, uses a lot of um, water to be, um, use a lot of energy uh, to be able to provide those services and then the delivery and getting the water to us and stuff like that also uses a lot of water. So this is our first poll. Um, if you could bring it up, Brandon. How much water per person per day do you guys think that we use by gallon? Um, yeah, so how many gallons of water per person per day does an individual in Florida use? You can just keep it up for like another five, 10 seconds, that's fine. This question, I always find it interesting because, you know, and, and I added this range on purpose. Sometimes people say really high numbers, sometimes people say really low numbers, or sometimes we'll get it perfect. Um, so the answer is 100 uh, on average. So you'll see as I keep going, um, you'll see that there that different places use um, different amounts of water, but here in Florida, it's about 100 gallons per person. So let's talk about water and why that's such an important uh, resource here in Florida. So in the world, there's about 71%, it's covered by 71% water, right? Uh, but most of that is salt water or water that we can't use. So 2.5% of that is fresh water on average. Um, but again, a lot of that is locked in glaciers or underground in places that are either impossible or just really hard to get to. 
So only about 1% of all the water in the world is fresh water that we can readily use. So that's to show how important water is. So in this graphic, first let's look at the colors. So the colors are talking about what we just talked about, the gallons per person per day. Um, so you can see Florida is about 76 to 100, but then you can see in the West, a lot of states in the USA use a lot more water. So water is going to become a more important resource as we move forward. And given that the percentages that you guys see on all of these um, uh, states is the percent of population increase by 2030. So that's not that far from now. And you can see Florida is projected to go about 79% uh, up. So water is going to become a very important resource. And here, specifically in Miami-Dade County, we're expected by 2030 to have about 3.2, 3.3 million people. And I'm sure all of us have driven in Florida, and there's already a lot of people. There's already a lot of cars. So can you imagine another few million people here? And now I'll, I'll let Patrick continue uh, presenting on Miami-Dade County Water. Okay, thanks, Diego. Good morning, everybody. I'm Patrick Martin. I'm the Water Use Efficiency, water use efficiency Manager for Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department. Uh, next slide. And uh, so this is just a map for those of you who are not familiar with Miami-Dade County. I think most of you are, but uh, it shows the location of the county. We are um, the most populated county in the state of Florida. Uh, we have a population just over about 2.5 million, 2.6 million people here in the county. Um, it's the seven, and it's the seventh most populated state, I'm sorry, seventh most populated county in the United States. Next slide. So uh, we're a big county, uh, we have a lot of people. And so um, Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department serves a majority of the, of the residents of the county. We provide both water and wastewater services. And uh, as a result, we're the largest utility in the Southeast United States. We're the ninth largest utility in the country. We serve about 2.3 million people a day. Um, there's about 2,600 people that work in the department and we have an operating budget uh, close, actually closer to $800 million. So we're a big department. Next slide. And uh, just to follow up on what Diego was saying, there's a really close relationship between water and energy. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to reiterate, there's a lot of information on the web. Here are just a couple of bullets about some data that I was able to obtain from the, from the web in regards to the relationship between water and energy. And here in Miami-Dade County, and specifically Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department, we use a lot of energy to produce water. Uh, if you think about it, it's the area, the geography here in South Florida is flat. So when we produce water, in order to distribute it, we have to use a lot of energy and pumps to pump the water around the distribution system so the water gets to your home. That's an example of, one example of how much energy is used just within the water and sewer department to get water to you. And then of course, when you flush your toilets and take a shower, that wastewater then has to get pumped to the wastewater treatment plant. And that also takes a lot of energy to do that. Next slide. Uh, so one of the basic questions I ask people when I'm doing this presentation is where does our water come from? Uh, and so a lot of people may not really know where our water comes from. Next slide. And so uh, to answer that question, our water, most of our water in Miami-Dade County comes from the Biscayne Aquifer, which is a shallow aquifer that's right below our feet. And it's made up of highly permeable limestone. It's close to the surface, so actually um, people, may, may, people who have homes that have a uh, irrigation system with a pump in the backyard, that's actually tapping into a shallow well, which is the top of the Biscayne Aquifer. So the water is very close to the surface. It's a very unique aquifer because it's coastal, meaning it merges with the uh, Atlantic Ocean and we're right up against salt water. And most people don't realize this, but the aquifer is managed by the state of Florida. So Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department have to, has to apply for a permit to um, take water out of the aquifer to the state of Florida. Next slide. This is a, a, a pictograph of what the aquifer looks like where it's located. So as you can see, 
you've got the coastal communities here, which would be the city of Miami Beach, for example, and then you get further west, the city of Miami, and then west of that are the, are the, are the western suburbs, and then west of the suburbs is the Everglades, and then right under us is the aquifer, the Biscayne Aquifer, and you can see how it's right up against the ocean on the east side. And then below, there's another aquifer called the Florida Aquifer, but that's actually a, uh, that's made up of, uh, it's a brackish water aquifer, so there's salt water in it. So most of our water does, comes from the Biscayne because the Biscayne is made up of fresh water. Florida Aquifer, we do tap into that, but we don't use a lot of that water because it's more expensive. It's much deeper and we have to take the salt out. So it's a, it's a more involved process and it's more expensive. But the majority of our, of our the aquifer is actually recharged by rainfall. And a lot of that rainfall uh, falls in the Everglades and of course, anywhere here in South Florida, but because there's so much cement in the urban, urban core of the, uh, of the county, a lot of the water recharging the aquifer comes down through the Everglades where it's open, undeveloped. And so that's a very important recharge area for the Biscayne Aquifer. Next slide. Um, so what are some of the problems that the Biscayne Aquifer faces? Well, one of them is uh, historically has been overpumping. Our population is growing, as Diego had mentioned. Uh, there's a demand, a large demand for fresh water. So we've uh, unfortunately overpumped certain areas of the aquifer, particularly by the coast. Uh, contamination can occur of just pollutants that get into the aquifer from human activity. And also a big issue now is saltwater intrusion. Since the aquifer is directly up against the, uh, the ocean, there's that pressure of saltwater intruding into the aquifer. Next slide. Uh, so this is a uh, pictograph that just provides how saltwater intrusion occurs in wells. And so you can see these two wells would be wells that would drill down into the aquifer into fresh water. But as time goes on, with the pressure of increasing sea level rise and demand for water, you can get, if, if we don't monitor closely these wells, you can have saltwater intruding into the wells. And once saltwater gets into a freshwater well, it's pretty much impossible to reverse it and those wells would have to be abandoned. And so Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department is trying to prevent that from happening. We have an extensive um, saltwater monitoring. We monitor the saltwater front, it's called, uh, to, and we, we check our wells at chloride levels. And uh, so we have an extensive monitoring program to monitor that saltwater front to ensure that it doesn't get into our freshwater wells. Next slide. And so uh, this is just, a discussion on what are some of the threats and risks and efforts that the water and sewer department have to deal with to ensure clean water being provided to our residents and uh, sufficient wastewater services. So one of the big issues is uh, aging infrastructure. So for the most part, uh, most residents don't see the water and sewer department's infrastructure, which is a good thing. It's all underground or it's pump stations or wastewater treatment plants and water treatment plants that are away from population centers. And when everything's working fine, you basically would not even know what's going on as long as you go into your home and put your faucet on. People are happy that water comes out of the tap. And when you flush your toilet, that, that wastewater is taken away. And so the issue, one of the things we have to deal with though is aging infrastructure. We have an older uh, uh, housing stock and older uh, county services here in Miami-Dade County. And so there's that a constant effort of having to upgrade our infrastructure. Um, we are experiencing sea level rise, as I mentioned before, and so that has a set of its own challenges, uh, dealing with the infrastructure that's exposed to that salt water and that, those, high, those rising seas. Uh, we are getting changes in our precipitation patterns. Sometimes we're seeing more, sometimes we're seeing less, and so we have to deal with that to ensure a sufficient flow of water to our residents. We have to deal with natural disasters such as hurricanes, of course, um, and then we have population growth, for example, and there's an increasing population that demands fresh water and, and, and good wastewater services. Next slide. So uh, this is a card you're going to uh, receive for people who are participating in this um, webinar. You are going to receive a kit that's going to have a bunch of uh, energy and water saving devices in it, but included is this edu education card, which basically just shows that pictograph I discussed earlier of where of what Miami-Dade County's water resources looks like and some of the issues that we're dealing with. I have on there uh, indication of saltwater intrusion, how that occurs. And on the back of the card is uh, some really good water conservation 
tips. So please take a look at that card and, and pass it around to your friends and family so they can familiarize themselves with our, with our resources here in Miami-Dade County. Next slide. So, um, you know, I've talked on a, on a much larger scale, but I, I want to bring it down to more of a granular level to the individual. So what can you as an individual do to conserve water? And just to repeat, water conservation is really important because we have a limited resource. And as Diego mentioned, we have a growing population that's going to demand clean water. And so we have to ensure that the department can provide a sufficient supply of water to the population. So as an individual, water conservation is very important. And there's a lot of things that you can do to save water. Next slide. Oh, uh, real quick, um, Brandon, if you could do the poll for this one also. So what, what do you guys think that we use the most water on at home when we're all at home, especially now that we're at home a lot more? Thanks, Brandon. Okay, so that's a really interesting results. Um, actually, so the, the uh, results are showing the kitchen faucet using the wa most water followed by the shower, followed by a toilet, and then followed by the washing machine. But um, in actuality, the biggest user of water in your home is your toilet. Um, you know, an older, an older toilet can use upwards of four to five gallons per flush. So uh, that's a lot of water. And in light of COVID-19, people are home more often. Think about how many times you might flush a toilet in one day. You know, you're upwards of five times at least per person per day flushing the toilet, using the toilet. And if you multiply that, multiply that by the number of people in a home, Say, for example, there are four people at home, you're talking about the toilet being flushed 20 times per day. So it's, uh, it's a lot of water being used by the toilet. But this uh, pie chart shows the actual um, average use of water in a home. And as you can see, the toilet uses the most, followed by the shower, and then followed by faucets, and then the clothes washer. What's interesting about this pie chart is, if you look on there, it indicates that leaks account for about 12% of water use in a home. And that's something that, um, I uh, just want to mention that's very important for people to look out for leaks in their homes because when you have a leaking toilet or a faucet, for example, which are the two most common leaks in a home, that leak is occurring 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So that's a lot of water that's being wasted by just that drip or by that sound coming out of your toilet that it's running. So it's really important that people focus on repairing those leaks and stopping them. Next slide. So uh, we're talking about toilets and showers, right? So what you can do as an individual to conserve water right off the top is you don't even have to change your habits. It's just by changing your fixtures in your home and your bathroom specifically to high efficiency fixtures. Uh, an old, like I mentioned, an old toilet can use upwards of four to five gallons per flush. An old shower head can use upwards of three to five gallons per minute of water. Same thing with faucets. But now that the new high efficiency models significantly reduce the amount of water that you use. So for example, a high efficiency toilet would only use about 1.28 gallons per flush. Uh, and a high efficiency shower head and faucet would only use about 1.5 gallons per minute. And these uh, devices have been so well designed that you will not be giving up the functionality and the performance of the fixtures uh, in, in light of the fact that they're high efficiency. So don't be afraid to go and uh, check these devices out. And what we'll do, the county actually incentivizes people to install these fixtures in their homes and we'll give you a rebate. We'll give you up to $50 for to uh, buying a new toilet, $25 for faucets and $25 for shower heads. So that's a great program that's going on now in the county to incentivize people to change out their old water wasting fixtures. And we basically do that in any type of residential Property, single family homes, multifamily homes. Uh, we uh, also reach out to uh, the lodging, hotels and motels. We actually have a senior program for, for senior residents that have the senior rebate on their property taxes. We'll give them even more money back. We'll give them money for back for buying the toilet and also for installing it. Next slide. 
And uh, we also encourage people to, if they don't want to buy the new shower head, for example, we'll actually give them a new one. By, if they bring in their old shower head, we'll exchange it for a new high efficiency 1.5 gallon per minute shower head. Once again, we reach out to all different types of residential properties and businesses. And you can just contact our customer service center uh, that will do the exchange for you. You just bring in your old shower head and we'll give you a new one in return. We also will provide dye tablets if you want to check to see if your toilet is, is actually leaking. We'll give those dye tablets out for free. You just drop one of the tablets into the tank of the toilet and then wait a few minutes and open up the toilet seat cover. And if the, if the color blue is in the toilet bowl, there's a good chance that you have a leak from the tank to the toilet. You want to fix that. We'll also give out uh, new swivel spout aerators for the kitchen. And we have a lot of conservation messaging to educate you on how you can conserve water other ways. Next slide. And uh, another very popular program, rebate program we have here, in addition to the high efficiency fixture program, is we actually will provide free evaluations to your, um, to your landscaping, to your lawn. If you have a functioning in-ground irrigation system in your property, the county will come out for free and assess it, and we'll provide recommendations to make that system more water efficient. And if you follow up through with the recommendations, those recommendations are associated with rebates and you can get money back for upgrading your property. And that we reach out to both single family homes and large properties. And then of course, just you as an individual, what else can you do? Pretty simple, kind of logical things, but takes a bit of effort. Uh, you know, when you're doing uh, your laundry and your dishes, if you're using a dishwasher, which is the more favored way of washing dishes, believe it or not, it's actually dishwashing uses less water. I'm sorry, uh, dishwashers use less water than doing them by hand, but only do full loads in both the laundry and dishwashing. Uh, you want to fix any drips and leaks, like I mentioned, and that's really, really important. Um, install high efficiency fixtures in your bathroom, like I mentioned, and reduce your shower time. A lot of people take 30, 25, 30, 45 minute showers that uses a lot of water. An effective way of reducing your water use is by just right, by reducing your, your shower time. Ideally, it'd be great if you can take a five minute shower, but I know some people may think that's unrealistic. So any, any effort you make in reducing your time in the shower is very helpful. And that's indoors and outdoors. Um, there's a lot you can do, you know, use a broom instead of using a hose to uh, clean up your driveway or your, your steps. Uh, you know, use a bucket to wash your car. Definitely put a, um, a, a self-canceling uh, uh, hose control uh, on the a nozzle on your on your hose. Uh, let's see. You definitely would be great if you could take your grass, replace your grass in your home with Florida-friendly plants. Those plants attract native animals, and they and they don't need a lot of water. They're suited to our climate here in South Florida. We also have a great rain barrel program here in the county. Uh, for encouraging people to collect their rainwater coming off their roof and use that to water their lawns and, and yards instead of um, using um, your, your uh, you know, potable water for doing that. And so those are just logical, simple things you can do. Definitely back indoors, you know, reduce the amount of, you know, turn off your faucets when you're showering, I mean, sorry, when you're shaving and, uh, you know, th logical things like that and brushing your teeth. Uh, those are simple things that you can do that can save a lot of water. Next slide. So now I'm going to focus on uh, going from water conservation to drinking Miami-Dade County water uh, versus drinking bottled water. That's something that um, is uh, very common, unfortunately. And I just read an interesting article uh, in regards to this. From an environmental perspective, drinking tap water is a really good way to go versus buying bottled water. Um, I just read an article in New Times about a cleanup that occurred along the MacArthur Causeway a, few, a, a week or so ago. And uh, an incredible amount of garbage was collected on the roadways. And what was learned was that the majority of garbage that was collected was, um, were plastic bottles that people had discarded. Um, and so really bad for the environment. So let me move on to the next slide about educating you why drinking tap water is better than buying bottled water. So um, question, now, Diego, I don't know, is this a, um, I don't know if this is a questionnaire that we have. But, no, I didn't make this one a poll. But okay. I, oh, yeah. <laughs> that might be a good one to do. It'd be interesting yeah. to see what people's results are. But anyway, my question to you is, do you drink tap water or do you drink bottled water? And 
what I found when I've done pre-COVID, when I was actually going out to the community and, uh, and meeting people, I would ask that question and ask people to raise their hands who drink bottled water. And you know, oftentimes it was at least 50% of the audience would raise their hands. And, and I'm not surprised, you know, bottled water has become extremely popular. Um, but there is a lot of misinformation about bottled water that gets us, um, projected out to people uh, from the bottling water companies that aren't really true. And that's one of the reasons why uh, bottled water has become so popular. Tap water is, is really a great resource to drink versus buying bottled water. Uh, one of the things I think that people think is that bottled water is safer than tap water, which is not true at all. Tap water, Miami-Dade County water, I can tell you, is tested thousands of times a year. We have to abide by strict federal and state criteria. Uh, and so oftentimes tap water is safer than bottled water. Um, tap water is definitely tested more frequently than bottled water. And also bottled water companies are not required to provide the results of their testing. Unlike um, Miami-Dade County, we have to actually publish our findings and send those out to the residents. And interestingly enough, a good a lot of bottled water comes from tap water. They just take city water, they may put it through another filter and then put a slap it, put into a bottle, slap a label on it, and uh, sell it to you for a thousand percent more than what it costs you to get the same water from tap water. Um, and so uh, oftentimes taste is a big issue where people like to drink bottled water, bottled water versus tap water, but that's usually due to the mineral content and chlorination. Um, what I tell people is that if they don't like the taste of their tap water in their home, you can buy a simple filter for your um, kitchen faucet and that will usually uh, eliminate any of the taste that you that you're experiencing but also oftentimes taste is also acquired right so the more you drink your tap water at home the more you're going to get used to it uh, versus versus drinking bottled water next slide so uh, what's interesting too is people don't think about the cost of bottled water versus tap water bottled water is actually really expensive and so this table shows you um, and we, it's normalized with a, uh, with a normalized volume of water comparing uh, bottled water to milk and to gasoline and to tap water, you can see that bottled water is actually very expensive and much more expensive than tap water. Your tap water is a really good deal and it's very inexpensive. Next slide. And as far as from the environmental perspective, uh, bottled water is a really bad thing for the environment. Uh, just within the U.S. alone, there's something like 42 billion plastic bottles of water are, are sold a year. And uh, actually, it takes fuel, fossil fuels, to create plastic that's used for the bottles, which goes back to Diego's point about polluting and creating um, more problems in the environment by burning all that fuel to produce the plastic bottles uh, contributes to global warming. And so by reducing the amount of bottles that bottled water that you buy, you're actually also helping the environment by reducing uh, global warming and contributing to global warming. And unfortunately, a good chunk of plastic bottles are not recycled. And that's, you can see that by driving along MacArthur Walk Causeway, like I mentioned, seeing all the plastic bottles have been discarded along the side of the road, but many of them end up in landfills, small portion. I read recently that something like only 10% of plastic bottles are actually recycled uh, I think worldwide. So, um, so you know, it, it really contributes to the to the environmental degradation. They end up in landfills, and plastic takes a long time to break down. And then also, if you think about it, not only uh, are you using few uh, fossil fuels to produce uh, to produce the plastic to make the plastic bottle, the bottle is then filled with water, and then it has to be transported to the store. So, depending on where what bottled water someone buys. They can buy Fiji water, which comes from Fiji in the South Pacific. Think about the transportation of that bottle from Fiji to your store in Miami, how much fossil fuels are burned to get that bottle to you. So uh, it's an incredible amount of energy that's used that also contributes to global warming and pollution. So by eliminating using bottled water, you really reduce the amount of environmental degradation that occurs. Next slide. And just to summarize, really, you can uh, drink with confidence when you drink Miami-Dade Miami -Dade County water. Uh, it's very high quality. It meets or exceeds all drinking water requirements set by the state and federal government. It's good for the environment. You're not using plastic bottles. Uh, what I suggest you do is go get a reusable water bottle, fill it up with your tap, and take that with you. Uh, we test our water regularly to abide by the state and federal rules, and you'll save yourself a lot of money. 
Awesome. <clears throat> Thanks, Patrick. You're welcome. So, and I want to add one thing to that, because um, sometimes one thing that me and Patrick have heard when we do these presentations is, oh, but I read this article that says it's bad, or oh, I read this article, this happened in Miami-Dade, or this happened in this city. At the end of the day, one thing that Patrick has said before, which I agree with, is just call your municipality, call your city, call whoever it is, if you really have a doubt. Because the city will tell you, the county will tell you if there is any problem with the water currently. But like he said, it gets tested regularly, results are posted online, and they, like, they're legally required to do that. So um, thank you, Patrick, and drink with confidence for sure. <laughs> um, so moving on, let's talk about energy now. So um, we just talked a lot about water. Let's see why energy is so important. And I do believe there's a poll for this one. Um, what uses the most energy at home? What do you guys think? Is it, um, I forget which ones I put on this poll. Um, if you could pull it up, Brandon. But what do you guys think uses the most? Is it your AC, your washer and dryer, um, all the lighting in your house, if, you know? Um, the TV, or um, what do you guys think? Thanks, Brandon. So most of you said the AC, um, that is a good answer. It is your AC. Um, let me show you guys. So AC is a significant, um, contributor to how much energy and uh, that we're using at home, followed by, and we're going to talk about pretty much all of these and how um, you can, um, as an individual, change your habits or change things to reduce your energy. The water heater, lighting, uh, your washer dryer, refrigerator, electric ovens, and things like that. So AC is the most important, so let's talk about that one. So these are a few tips. Um, me, personally, I will tell you that honestly, I do use a fan at home. Most of the time when I'm at home, like right now, all I have is this fan because I work right here, right? This is my little office. <laughs> so I don't turn on the AC pretty much all day, which might sound crazy, but um, I've gotten used to it basically. It's, it's not that um, the fan might not be the coldest thing, but it's something that you like get used to if you want to. Um, check and replace your filters. I know you probably have heard that your entire life and most of us don't, and I include myself in that sometimes. But yeah, like clean your filters, buy new filters for uh, your AC and things like that, because that way your AC runs more efficiently, um, which uses less energy. So, you know, try to close your curtains during the day when it's like really, really hot or get um, solar filters, which is basically a little film you can put on your windows that reduces um, UV lighting and heat from coming into your house. And like I said, uh, said, um, trying to get yourself used to a warmer temperature in your house, like setting your thermostat to 78 to 80. I know that sounds um, as crazy as taking a five minute shower, but what I always try to tell people, and we'll go through more tips and tricks to save water and energy as we continue now, but what I try to tell people is um, you don't have to be perfect. If you're used to having your AC at 70, what I tell people is try to do 71, try to do 72, try to do 73, see what you can get used to and see what you can get to. Because at the end of the day, not only would it save you money by saving energy, but it's also helping the environment. And I know our generation definitely cares a lot about the environment. Um, so those are just, yeah, some quick tips specifically for um, AC units. Let's see. And then I'm just going to keep talking about different tips and tricks. Some of these are going to be water. Some of these are going to be energy. Um, most of them are connected. Um, LED light bulbs throughout your housing. Um, I know a lot of people rent, but I'll tell you this, me personally also, um, I bought like 10 LED light bulbs about three years ago. Everywhere that I've lived since then, which has been renting, I switch my lighting as soon as I get there. I take every single light bulb out. I put an LED. And then when I move out, I take, I put the light bulbs back and I take my LEDs with me. So I'm saving energy by lowering my power bill while, while I live there, even though I'm a renter. Um, and as we've been talking all day, by saving energy, you're helping Miami-Dade County by saving water. Um, if, you, if you have that type of AC, um, using a programmable thermostat always helps. Same thing, if you, if you have a regular schedule where you're not home for certain times, 
maybe while you're not home, let your AC turn a little bit hotter, right? A little bit warmer in the house and then program it to go down for you to be comfortable when you get home. Using power strips is another really quick tip. That's what I do. I connect everything to a power strip. That way at the end of the night or whenever I'm done working or using certain things, I just turn off the power strip itself and it doesn't use electricity anymore because uh, if you guys don't know a lot, a lot of phone chargers and electronics overall still use energy even when they're quote unquote turned off. Um, moderate your refrigerator temperature. This might be one that people don't think about too much, but some people keep their temperature in the refrigerator way too cold and you can actually turn that down and your fridge will be fine unless you're opening it a lot of times during the day. Um, energy efficient appliances, as, as I said, I know that that's an expensive one and that's a hard one. If you can't do that, it's okay. Like try to change your behaviors. Um, low flow shower heads and uh, low flow faucets. So participants today, I, I'll be sending a post survey, which please complete the post survey because uh, that's how I measure how many toolkits I can give out for free. Um, so in that toolkit, you'll be getting things like a low flow shower head and a efficient light bulb, um, LED night lights. Um, I know some people use night lights. So it's an LED light, night light, um, a leak detection tablet so that you can use that and um, make sure that you're not um, uh, wasting energy or water by uh, having a leak that you didn't notice. Um, you do get a shower timer. So you put it in your shower and you turn it around into a little hourglass. And by the time you're done, or you should be done by the time the hourglass is over and it's a five minute one. Again, I'll say if you take a 30 minute shower, maybe consider 25. If you take a 20 minute shower, try to reduce that and get to a place that you're comfortable but keep in mind you're saving water and energy by reducing um, your usage, which is good for the environment. Um, and then another one, this one's a hard one too, but check your water heater temperature. If you have access to it, a lot of the times you don't, but if you do, water heaters are often set to about 140 degrees um, to heat up your water for when you shower and when you cook and everything. But you can actually keep it at like 110 or 120 and that reduces your energy usage by a lot and you still will have more than enough um, hot water for you to shower. Okay, and this is, so these are just a few tips for outdoor water, um, saving water outdoors. Uh, even if you're not a homeowner, I encourage you to pay attention and uh, maybe teach these tips and tricks to some homeowners that you might know. So one is cutting your grass too short is actually not good for it and you'll need to water it more often. So avoid cutting your grass way too short. You can test your grass to see if you have to water it by stepping on it. And if you, if you leave a solid footprint, then your grass might need a little, a little bit of water. But if it leaves no footprint whatsoever, then it means your grass is healthy and you don't need to water it currently. Um, sprinkle with care, right? Like don't, don't sprinkle your water on, after about 10 a.m. because it starts getting really warm outside. And before 6 p.m., same thing, it's really warm outside. So most of that water would evaporate anyways. Uh, so do it early in the morning or later in the evening. And like Patrick already mentioned earlier, plant Florida native uh, plants and lawns and stuff like that, uh, that because they, they're used to living here in Florida, right? So they use a lot less um, water. And then the fertilize, um, and fertilizer, don't over fertilize because that can end up in our water systems, which makes it harder for Miami-Dade County to clean our water and give us clean water. And then another few, um, I'm not gonna go through all of them because we've already talked uh, about a lot of these, but yeah, only use your washer and dryer when they're full because that both reduces your water and energy usage. Same thing for the dishwasher. Um, if you leave any cups of water around the house, try not to throw them out. You know, sometimes people just throw them out, give them to your pet or use it to water your plants. Another easy one for those of us that have a lot of plants, um, when it rains outside, sometimes I take my plants outside and I just let them get water that way um, to save some um, water. So I don't, um, Teddy did, G Marie make it. Can you hear me? 
<laughs> Yay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I got excited. Um, awesome. Uh, so we have Jean Marie from Miami-Dade County Solid Waste, and she will be presenting on Recycling Right. Okay. Um, ready to go. You've got the screen. Okay, so this is a quick summary of the Dade County Single Stream Recycling Program. Um, we serve about 350,000 single family homes. These are the little blue and green carts that um, you see at people's homes. Um, we collect about 60,000 tons annually, and I'll come back to that because let me tell you, the last few months have been unbelievable in what's being collected. Um, and we changed our program from the little open 18-gallon um, bins to the 65-gallon carts in 2008. And let me tell you, it really, really helped as far as getting people to enjoy recycling and really wanting to recycle. And we have two companies that collect the materials. We can go to the next screen and they bring them to a uh, materials recovery facility where they are separated. And I like to show this early in the program because um, people say to me sometimes, well, I don't know what happens to it after it goes in the cart. It probably just goes in the garbage. Well, no, really it doesn't. Your good recyclable materials goes to a materials recovery facility. And that's where the materials are separated and they are shipped to companies that then make new materials out of them. Because let me tell you now, um, an item is not recycled unless it can be made into a new material and be used again. So that, that remember that for the rest of this presentation because it's gonna come up again. All right, what's our next slide? Um, okay, so getting back to what is recyclable. Let me tell you, people are very, very confused. Everyone being home has a lot of, um, there's questions, there's so many more materials. So we have made the simple five. The answer to all your questions about what is recyclable is the simple five. And we're talking about newspapers, cans, cartons, cardboard, and bottles. That's what goes in the blue recycling cart. It's not that, it's not in the cart. So starting with paper. Well, this is of course newspaper and there has not been a lot of newspaper for several years, but there's lots of different kinds of paper. There's writing paper. Um, there's, uh, I don't know, just, well, we'll get to the other kinds of paper, but, but it needs to be clean and dry. Don't wrap fish in it or put it in the bottom of the bird cage and then put it in your recycling cart. That's not clean and dry newspaper or any kind of paper. So we want it clean and dry and unsoiled. Cans, cans are definitely recyclable. Whether they're aluminum or steel, um, they just need to be empty. You don't even have to crush them. Just put them right in the cart, but don't leave stuff in them. I don't wanna see beans in the bottom of your, your vegetable can. Just they should be cleaned out or you know wiped out. Just, just no more beans in the can, you get it. Don't need to be crushed. And let me tell you, here, it takes so much less electricity to make cans from already made cans, from recycled cans, than to mine the bauxite or, or take out the steel. It's, um, it's, it's such a better process to make cans from cans because, um, as you know, if you're saving a lot of, of power, a lot of electricity, you're also saving what? Everybody say it at the same time? Water. Right. Okay, great. Let's go to the next slide. Cartons. Sometimes you don't realize that cartons are definitely recyclable. Orange juice, juice, milk, they also need to be emptied out. But these are made with um, high-grade paper, actually, and, this, uh, and they're super recyclable. Again, they're, they're made into tissue paper, to be honest with you, but um, they use, uh, you know, they're made from paper, from recycled paper. So this is really good. So um, definitely recycle your cartons. Hey, Jean, Jean Marie, really quick, sorry. Um, just, uh, there's a strict 930 deadline. So if oh. it's okay with you, would you be able to just um, continue until you're done with what we can recycle? Yes. And I'll, I'll keep going from there. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So what do we have after cartons? Oh, cardboard. Okay, 
So really fast about cardboard. Cardboard is definitely recyclable, but it has to be unsoiled, of course, and empty and broken down. We are having so many issues right now because people have so much cardboard coming to their house that um, the, they just are stacking their cardboard up on top of their carts. We cannot take that cardboard. You have to tear it up, put it in your cart. The only way we can recycle it is if it's inside the cart. All right, and I think the last thing is, let's go to bottles. And um, as I know we have water bottles here shown, you can use tap water, but we're, there's lots of other kinds of bottles that are used, um, soap bottles and, um, and, and glass bottles. So just make sure your bottles are empty, um, the caps are okay, flatten the, flatten the plastic ones before you put them in the cart, and just make sure everything is empty and dry when you put them in the recycling cart. And that's, is that it? If you want me to stop here, that's okay. I just wanted to make sure everybody knew what they could recycle. Um, actually, if you want, could you talk about plastic bags? Oh my God. This one. Plastic bags, that is super, super. <laughs> Thank you for showing this slide. Please never put plastic bag in your recycling cart. A lot of times people take the plastic bags, put their good recyclable material in it, and then dump it in the cart. That does not get recycled. The, the screen that you see right now, that is what happens to the bags when they go to the recycling facility. They wrap around the equipment. We actually have to shut down the plant every couple of hours and dig those bags out. So what can you do with plastic bags? Reuse them for kitty litter bring them back, bring the clean ones back to any kind of store you can imagine. There's, there's uh, places to accept them. Just do not put them in the recycling cart. Yes. Awesome, thank you so much, Jean Marie, and sorry to have to cut it a little bit short. No worries, thanks for letting um, me see. So I will continue just to finish up the presentation real quick and then give you guys a second to ask questions. Um, just tying it back to global warming. So global warming is a natural, um, occurrence, right? It's, it's a cycle that goes, uh, the planet gets warmer, then it gets cooler. The problem is that us humans, by producing too many plastic bottles, by um, spewing out too many uh, greenhouse gases, we're causing the earth to heat at an unsustainable rate. Um, I'm not going to go too much into that. I'm sure you guys know that, but this, this is a really important one just to show you guys that it is a cycle, right? You can see CO2 and temperature correlated with each other for thousands of years. The problem is when we get to today or closer to today, uh, we see that uh, CO2 is going up and our temperature is going up with it. And the biggest difference is that us humans are putting too many of these um, out into the environment. And this one's just to show you a little bit more accurately that around the industrial revolution, you can see around the 1700s is where CO2 concentration went up and we can see that temperature is currently rising as well. Uh, and you guys can see some of the sources. It can come from agriculture, all of our transport, even moving our food uh, to us. Why does it matter to South Florida? We are a coastal area. Sea level rise in saltwater intrusion is going to be very negative for us. And you guys already saw Patrick talk about how, you know, how important salt, or saltwater intrusion, how, how much it can affect Miami-Dade County water and sewer. And then economic drivers, the more flooding there is and the more hurricanes and things like this that occur because of global climate change, uh, the more damage and the more money we're going to have to spend. And algae blooms, right now we're having a die out of fish currently, right? And I'm sure you guys have tried to um, go to the beach and you can't because of um, any, any other issue. Um, yeah, uh, let's, let's go ahead and move on to the questions. If you guys have any questions, I just wanted to show real quick. FPL, if you use FPL, um, they provide you with the energy you're using. It's good to pay attention. Miami-Dade County has a lot of incentives online for you guys. We have a lot of resources as well. Um, and thank you guys again. I'll send a follow-up uh, for, for you guys to do the survey and get your toolkits for free. Um, and just remember, reduce, reuse, and recycle to make a happier planet. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, w w just to to remind you, this webinar is going to be recorded. Diego is going to send like a really cool follow up with the with the all the links you need on the on the Dreaming Green website, on Miami Dade County, Water and Sewer, and, and Solid 
waste. Thank you so much, uh, Diego, Jean-Marie, Patrick. It's a great presentation. We have some questions from our attendees. So um, actually for the pickup of the, the, the giveaway, we'll probably, we're gonna discuss that, but we'll probably have them at my office because everybody in, the, in this webinar are from uh, UM and uh, we can arrange together uh, when you can pick it up. Uh, that's uh, no, no problem. Let's go to your questions. So the first one, uh, and that's probably for, for, for Patrick, what is the safest warm temperature for your fridge and freezer? Or maybe Diego, I don't know. I don't, I don't know a number. I don't know if Patrick or Jean Marie would know an answer to that one, but I would say it's, it's up to, it depends on you. It depends on how you use your fridge, how often you're opening it. And um, at least my temperature, my fridge doesn't let me pick an exact number. So I just have it a little bit under half, like, you know, the little knob thingy. Um, yeah, they, um, um, I think it's also when you, when, when you, fridge start freezing that's not a good sign to yeah like if you're if your fruits and vegetables and stuff are frozen then maybe yeah reduce it <laughs> another question is where can we recycle our led bulbs and batteries i'm trying to think if i know a specific place i know best buy best buy is one place that you can take your led light bulbs and batteries and they will take them but I'm sure a lot of big... Um... I can answer that if you want, Diego. Sure, but, uh, yeah. Let's consider universal waste. And batteries are two different things. You have the alkaline, the, the little one, the disposable ones that uh, cannot be recycled. Miami, we, we, in the country, very, very few uh, counties are recycling those alkaline batteries. So if you want to recycle them, go on the website, miami.edu slash recycle. You'll find a link for batteries. And we have few options at UM actually on, on this. Uh, we have to ship it out basically uh, to another state where they recycle it. But uh, rechargeable batteries are hazardous waste, so we collect that separately. And uh, at home, you can send that to Universal Waste Bin at Home Depot. Home Depot, they accept the LED bulbs and the rechargeable batteries also. Teddy, awesome. at yeah. also um, the um, those not the LEDs like you were just talking about, all that material can go to Dade County's home chemical collection sites. It doesn't matter. You just have to live in Miami-Dade County. It doesn't matter where, a house, a dorm, an apartment, doesn't matter. Um, and we are open Wednesday to Sunday, nine to five. You can bring all kinds of things, paint, the batteries, the LED bulbs, all that kind of stuff will be accepted. We received the, 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 the information through the email Jig was gonna send. Um, okay. Another question, there are some associations that don't allow to recycle cartons and cardboard. Can this be reported? Um, so I'm thinking that uh, they're talking about like maybe uh, condos that are not um, uh, recycling pretty much. Uh, can you address that, Jen Mary? Yes, and, and someone later on also asked about glass. I was trying to answer that. You need to check with the program where you live or that you're using, like if you're in an apartment or whatever, because different places, especially now, have, um, have different uh, requirements. So um, just find out if they can't take it, they can't take it, because that's all I can tell you. But check with where you live. So we're at 9.30, so I want to ask Brandon, because we have a bunch of really cool questions, so I hope we can spend like another five minutes. Let me ask Brandon. Brandon, can we go over five minutes? Okay, we're good. Thank you. Yeah, Brandon is a magician from IT behind the, the scene, and so we'll we have a few minutes uh, to answer some more really interesting questions. So um, recycling that has been contaminated, such as peanut butter jar, uh, is there a process at the recycling plant to clean those jars or are they tossed? Question for Jen Mary, I'm guessing. They, they are tossed. They are tossed. Don't, don't even bother putting them in. I'll tell you, if you put it in the garbage, it will go to our waste to energy facility. So it's better to put it in the garbage than mess up all the recycling. Yeah. Another one is uh, uh, if plastic grocery bags are not recyclable, what do stores, what stores do with the ones we take back? They, I know Publix, and I'm sure the other places there actually have contracts with companies who buy those bags. They're recyclable by themselves. They just can't be extracted from the rest of the recycling. I know a lot of them go into a, uh, to something called plastic lumber. So they're, they are recycled. They just can't be recycled um, by, by our program. Uh, there was also a question that uh, recycling is always a, a favorite about, uh, about glass. 
Um, so Jean Marie, you probably have uh, an answer for that. That I will probably also uh, something else. So glass bottles are are they recycled? Okay, and that's another thing you have to check with your um, program. Um, yeah, our my residential program does accept glass, but many do not. So you have to check with where you live to find out if they accept glass or not. Right now, glass has a very, very, very low value. And like I said early in, my, in what I was talking about, if you can't make it into something else, then it's not recyclable. And right now, glass is not, is not a big thing for uh, people wanting to reuse it. Yeah, I've talked to uh, Sherry. The, the little video that I shared with you guys um, is, a, is a video done by the Green New Office on the journey of a plastic bottles on the way to uh, the Cambrocrans facility that we've visited several times. The okay. uh, Shashwar from Waste Management is there. And one of the things that he's not saying in there is that for uh, UM, uh, we accept the recycling glass. A lot of it is broken and becomes a contamination issue. Thing is, they're still using it and they repurpose it to, to, to lay out some path for landfill. into a landfill, but not buried in a landfill just as is, but it's okay. serve a purpose. So right. uh, something is done with the glass, but it's not repurposed into a new glass, for instance. So that's, that's uh, right. another thing that we need to be aware of. Uh, another question, um, uh, there was a question about uh, rain. <laughs> when it rains, does it really uh, mess up the whole thing? There's someone who needs to probably put on mute. I don't know if it's, uh, yeah. I, I just, um, yeah, yeah. I, so, <clears throat> Rain is it? Is it okay. the Jen Mary? Okay, so um, so what's the question? How uh, does like rain? When you leave your cardboard what? and stuff online. Um, oh yeah. Okay. Well, that's one of the reasons that it's so important. You need to tear up your cardboard if you want to recycle it and put it inside your cart. Um, a certain amount of the of the paper can dry out. You know, like if if it gets wet, they'll let it dry a little bit at the plant before they go. But once cardboard is like been I have pictures of cardboard on top of and around recycling carts because there's just so much of it. Number one, we can't pick that up. And number two, once that gets so wet that it's just falling apart, it's not really good anymore. Yeah. So best thing you can Another do is- question, Jen Mary, uh, uh, do you charge for an extra bin, recycling bin? There is not a charge for a second blue recycling cart. However, we, do not have extra carts right now. Um, so many people requested carts once everyone went to work from home um, and our suppliers are having huge difficulties getting plastic. So we have suspended second carts for right now in order to be able to provide carts to new homes and, and that's and as soon as our suppliers can start getting us carts, we'll redo that. But um, usually um, the second card is not a, uh, it doesn't charge. But the other thing is we have found people use their second cards for garbage and that has been a huge problem. Huge, yeah. huge problem. Yeah. But so, moving. Um, Jen Mary, uh, you, you're the, the queen. You know, uh, <laughs> people have a lot of questions about recycling. I hope the video uh, that uh, our uh, outreach coordinator, Kathleen uh, Rayopel uh, at Green U will be helpful also. Um, but basically, we're at 9.35, so we have to leave the, the, the room. But uh, thank you, everybody, for joining this webinar. Thank you, Diego. Thank you, Dreaming Green, mm -hmm. uh, great nonprofit. Uh, you need to go on their website, and, and, and you'll learn more. I'm going to receive this follow-up email. And um, um, thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Jean-Marie, for, for jumping on. And uh, Diego, if you want to say the last, uh, last few words. Oh, no, just uh, a little bit jealous that Jean Marie got all the questions. Um, but nah, thank you guys. Like, it, it's, it's fun. I hope to do it again. We'll try to answer the question by the follow up email. Okay, there yeah. were some, some leftovers. But thank you guys, and uh, see you for the next Green and Confined uh, series uh, event. Awesome. Thank you guys. Bye. Thanks.